it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague from the University of Toronto, Professor Brian Gettler, for today's talk. Professor Gettler's work is exceptionally well suited uh, to address so many of the questions that animate business, history, and the connections between indigeneity, race, capitalism, and colonialism, of course, which are so top of mind in our discussions around who we are in Canada. Writing and researching in both of Canada's official languages, Professor Gettler's work focuses upon the interactions of Indigenous peoples and colonial and Canadian financial policies in Quebec and Canada in the 19th and 20th centuries. His projects have concentrated upon money as both a symbol around which discourses of appropriate behavior were articulated, and also how money was used as a concrete tool in the governance of peoples and lands. And we, we really get to start thinking about money in a completely different way when we read his work. Uh, Professor Gettler's current research explores public finance and Crown First Nations fiscal relations, as well as Indigenous participation in the credit economy of the St. Lawrence Valley, both in the 19th and going into the 20th centuries. The title of Professor Gettler's talk today, which also acts, uh, I will say, as uh, of the latest episode of the CBHA's online talks, which means it will be recorded and available on our website, is Unmaking the Made Beaver, Money and Monopoly in the 19th and 20th Century Fur Trade. Uh, please welcome and go ahead, Professor Brian Gettler. Uh, thank you for the uh, generous introduction, Dimitri. Uh, I would like to, before I get started, um, share my screen. Is that possible? Can somebody allow me to share my screen so I can show a PowerPoint? Right. Okay. So um, also before I get started, I would like to mention uh, the elephant uh, or the children in the room, I guess. Uh, I have two small children at home, so it's entirely possible that they break in uh, and disturb us at some point. So please uh, bear with us if that happens. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my talk today draws uh, from my book, Colonialism's Currency, that was published in June uh, by McGill Queens University Press. The book paints a broad picture of money uh, and its role in 130 years of Canadian history, focusing on the imagery and stories it circulated, its contribution to common assumptions about Indigenous peoples, and its role in constituting colonial and later national space. In broad terms, the book weaves these three threads together to argue that Canadian society imagined itself in part through monetary representations of First Nations, the circulation of national currency across the vast territory to which Canada laid claim, uh, circulation enabled by Indigenous peoples, and the remarkably durable colonial consensus born in the 1820s and 1830s that Indigenous peoples were inherently improvident and therefore could not be trusted with money. Today I want to focus primarily on the second thread, that is Indigenous circulation of currency, by looking at the fur trade and shifting monetary space. I will argue several things about money in the fur trade. First, in contrast to much of the historiography, I want us to think of the fur trade as having been monetary from its very early days. Second, I will argue that First Nations played a key role in ending the fur trade's monetary regime in favor of first colonial, the colonial and later the federal monetary system. I will do this through an examination of two examples of Canadian currency replacing beaver money. Uh, Saguenay Lac Saint Jean in the mid 19th century and Western James Bay at the turn of the 20th century. Let's see. Okay, so this is what we're talking about the the, the area here, sort of to situate us the kind of global area that the, the book looks at. Uh, and I'll zoom in on a couple of these places uh, in the talk. Uh, before beginning, I need to say a few words on uh, money. I am not an economist, and therefore I'm not particularly interested in proving, disproving, or even adhering to textbook definitions of money. These tend to emphasize universality and timelessness over diversity and history. In other words, uh, they set aside Jörg Zimmel's astute observation that no single monetary form perfectly corresponds to theory, that no form of money is exactly and only what one would expect from Econ 101 alone. 
Uh, here are a number of authors that I find uh, particularly useful to think uh, along these lines. Instead, I will focus on money, on monetary practice, on money as action, process, or relationship, as much as on money as thing. This approach springs from a broad interdisciplinary literature, work, uh, including works of sociology, anthropology, history, law, and, and heterodox economics. Scholars working in this tradition point out not only money's role in the market, but also its political character. They highlight its use as a means of remembering the past, evaluating the present, and predicting the future. They underscore money's ability to cross cultural and linguistic divides despite or perhaps because of the absence of shared understanding of what it really is. They demonstrate how monetary practice in the not so distant European and North American past deviated substantially from economic theory, both historical and contemporary. And they remind us that people have always attached meaning to money that is not driven by market logic, or at least not alone. Of course, those economists who take a more functional view of money, uh, assigning it three, sometimes four uses, are not wrong. People employ money, like any technology, because it does something that at least some consider helpful. Indeed, Indigenous peoples, like their non-Indigenous neighbors, have long used money in their day-to-day -day lives, whether to earn a living or wealth in the market, to gain power or exercise control in political relations, or to give kindness or care to members of the community. They did so rather obviously, not by adhering to the tenets of political economy, but, by accor but according to their own cultural norms and practices. In what follows, I argue that the fur trade system of beaver money was not simply modernized barter, as one historian of the fur trade, Frank Tuff, calls it, but as an abstract unit of account used at multiple points in time constituted authentic money. To understand this money, we need to understand the two interlocking institutions that characterized the fur trade in the subarctic well into the 20th century, the annual cycle and the debt system. In idealized terms, indigenous hunter trappers arrived at the trading post in late summer and purchased on credit denominated in beaver currency, the goods necessary to carry out their family's winter hunt. At the beginning of the following summer, if not before, the individual who had received credit or a family member returned to the same post, selling the winter fur collection uh, to the company to, to settle their debt. Ideally, each hunter trapper would repay the entire amount owed at the beginning of the summer, thus allowing the fur trade company to turn a profit while maintaining uh, the trapper's access to credit. In practice, however, indigenous peoples were rarely debt free in this system. This closed commercial relationship served the interests of fur trading companies and particularly the Hudson's Bay Company in two ways. First, through the use of a pure system of book credits and debits, the HBC stood to make a profit on its fur purchases and on its sale of goods and provisions. Indeed, its post managers tended to charge higher prices for goods and pay lower prices for furs than their smaller competitors throughout the subarctic. In this sense, the HBC treated the goods it sold as unsecured loans, with the difference in market and company prices being equivalent to interest. Second, the HBC recognized that the use of freely circulating and universally accepted monetary instruments threatened its position and that trappers holding cash might take their consumer business elsewhere. However, because of the uncertain nature of hunts from one year to the next, the HBC was never able to impose a pure credit for furs system. If the company wished to prevent First Nations from turning to the competition while keeping them hunting for saleable furs rather than survival, especially following poor years when returns would not by themselves permit a family to outfit for the following season, it was often forced to sell goods on credit. In spite of its dual desire to conduct trade using only abstract monetary means and to retain its clientele, the HBC frequently felt that, that the dangers of allowing Indigenous clients to purchase merchandise on credit, that is, unpaid debt and, and the corresponding drain on profitability, outweighed the benefits, increased profits resulting from a captive clientele. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, the fur trade system of beaver money constituted one of present-day Quebec and Ontario's uh, two distinct monetary spaces. And indeed, this stretches beyond these regions, but that's where I'm focusing my attention today. Beside and sometimes overlapping with fur trade country, uh, country, the steadily growing area inhabited by settlers 
was home to official state accounting currency of initially British and later Canadian origin, alongside what was at first a wide variety of circulating forms of cash. The fortunes of the two monetary spaces shifted during the period, with beaver money having disappeared from much of the region by the early years of the 20th century. This shift accompanied an, another from older forms of territorial management and European claims to sovereignty exercised in part by royally sanctioned monopolistic corporations to their modern counterparts, almost exclusively based in the Victorian nation state. Like the reserve system, this process of currency replacement formed one of the visible ways through which the political community centered on the St. Lawrence Valley and the lower Great Lakes expanded to engulf and dominate the vast majority of present day Canada's territory and the population already living there. It also contributed to re-territorializing Canada and its imagined geography expanding the space understood by those in the colonies and the metropole as belonging to the settler polity and its state. In much of the subarctic and the west, this change was momentous, spelling the end of money that had been in use for centuries and transferring ultimate political authority from monopolist, monopolistic companies to the emerging nation state. Shortly after European um, Merchants arrived on the shores of Hudson and James Bay in the late 17th century, transactions in the region came to be structured through the use of the beaver pelt as the standard of trade. The English, who since 1670 had traded under the auspices of the HBC, referred to this standard, which expressed the theoretical value of a single, single prime beaver pelt as the made beaver, whereas French traders and their Montreal-based successors referred to it simply as the castor. Um, and here are some, some examples of this, uh, the, the Northwest Company uh, coin, for example. Regardless of its name, the beaver provided participants in the fur trade with the means of attributing market value. Primarily abstract rather than physical, beaver money quickly came to lose any direct relationship it may have initially had to the value of any given skin. And here I have a, a, a quote that I think makes this obvious. Um, and there's, there's, you know, come across these at multiple points in the, um, the archival record, but this is from a meeting between uh, William Johnson and Michelomackinac Ottawa chiefs uh, in Fort Niagara in 1764, where the chiefs ask Johnson or tell him, we are in great want of trade. Our family's in much distress. We beg you will permit us to trade as we have some furs and that the trade may be reasonable. We hope the traders will take a buckskin as a beaver and two doe skins as of the same value. Also four raccoons for a beaver and one bear skin, two small beavers to be as one and that you will take our deer skins. First Nations and traders, as well as we see here diplomats, discussed exchange value in abstract monetary terms, terms in which two beavers might be as one. Though evoked on occasion in diplomatic settings, in the archival record, beaver money most often appears in company ledgers. Oh, um, sorry, I missed, I missed a slide. Uh, I was gonna show you what a ledger looks like, but you've all seen ledgers before, uh, given the, the crowd. Um, <laughs> while the HBC, uh, tightly circumscribed debits and credits uh, calculated in beaver currency within relatively small geographic units, posts and districts, the language of price this monetary form afforded united the whole of fur trade company, country, excuse me. On occasion, however, beaver money did circulate in physical form as coins, uh, tokens, or stamped wooden sticks, like I showed you uh, a few moments ago. Perhaps obviously these monetary objects did not cir circulate universally. HBC, uh, May Beaver and Northwest Company Castor coins could only be used in one corporate network or the other. The main purpose of these objects, however, does not seem to have been wide circulation. Instead, these tokens seem uh, mainly to have been designed uh, as a material support for mental calculation. Uh, a use illustrated by this 1959 photograph of trading in Inukjuak uh, on the eastern shore of Hudson Bay. According to notes made by staff of the Museum of the Hudson's Bay Company in Winnipeg the same year, the system worked as follows. Uh, you'll notice here uh, they use the word skin, but this is, this is the same thing I'm suggesting uh, as beaver. For example, and I'm quoting, white fox might be worth 10 skins and the skin the skin's worth 50 cents. So the fox pelt would be worth $5 in Canadian money. 
10 tokens would be put on the counter by the trader in the trading room at the post. Then when the native went to purchase goods in the trade store worth five skins say, the trader would move five tokens over the counter to show the native how much he had to pay and move the other five tokens to indicate to him how much credit he had left. We have always, since the earliest trading days, kept actual book accounts while the natives have kept their records of debt and credit in their minds with surprising accuracy. Uh, and I would, I would point out here, this surprising accuracy is only surprising to the people who are not working on the ground. Uh, so often uh, management, upper management is, is convinced that indigenous peoples will forget how much money they owe or how much money they are owed. And in fact, this never happens. The fur traders you know, are constantly writing, uh, this, is, this is not a thing. Uh, they have a very good head for numbers uh, and uh, trappers remember these things. Although several scholars have remarked on the existence of this monetary system, none has underlined its fundamental role in the creation of the debt-based fur trade, an institution that has received far more attention. Yet without an abstract measure of value, the fur trade could only function through what traders called straight barter. So, uh, you know, I give you a chair and you give me a hat, uh, for example. The modern Innu word for 10 cents, uh, pushkwatai, uh, or half beaver skin, and the Moose Cree word for dollar, ate, or beaver pelt, further suggest that this was indeed uh, money and has been remembered as such. Following the appearance of beaver money and the simultaneous construction of permanent trading posts, First Nations and merchants could begin to exchange goods against future promises to pay, recorded in traders, ledgers, and in principle agreed upon by all parties to the transaction. Though as we'll see, uh, beavers, beaver money's market value did fluctuate, uh, almost always to guarantee profit for the company, something indigenous peoples uh, vigorously contested. Thus, this particular form of money, like forts, provided the fur trade with the infrastructure necessary to develop an ongoing economic relationship between First Nations and international capital. Beaver money's use as an abstract measure of furs, merchandise, and labor throughout fur trade company helps explain why indigenous trappers, who in the HBC's terms were attached to a given post, might decide to travel great distances to find better trading conditions. They could carry their made beaver conceptually, if not always physically, with them in search of higher prices for their furs or lower prices for provisions. In this sense, beaver money was as much a territorial currency as those developed by colonies and nation states across the globe through the late 19th century. Under monopoly conditions, furthermore, it allowed the HBC to mark the regions it controlled through a unique and locally intelligible means of expressing value. The process by which beaver money gave way to, to the Canadian monetary system then represents more than the disappearance of a pre-modern curiosity. Rather, it underlines the process through which the liberal democratic state over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries came to proclaim itself the legitimate institutional expression of national political community. It also suggests that the HBC and other chartered companies were central to the assertion of sovereignty by European crowns over much of the early modern world. So turning to my first uh, case here, um, oops. I'm missing, again, I'm missing a slide, um, excuse me. Um, so the first case, if we look at the, the map here is um, in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean. Uh, so this area um, sort of straight north uh, from, uh, from Quebec City. The first of our two cases uh, of shifting monetary space comes from the southwestern corner of Nitasinan, the Innu homeland, which covers a vast area of subarctic uh, Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador. In the 19th century, the Innu identified primarily as they had for generations with small local community that occupied the area drained by a major river system. The massive freshwater lake Lac Saint-Jean and the equally imposing Saguenay River into which it flows, currently known collectively as Saguenay-Lac Saint-Jean, form the southwesternmost uh, of these areas. Um, and this uh, provided kind of the main route into the interior for fur traders and merchants over several centuries. Um, and since the mid 17th century, the French and then British crowns barred settlement from the region, only allowing outsiders in who were involved in either the fur trade or the missionary efforts. And in the early 19th century, these efforts collided with settler society as it expanded from the Southwest. 
By the 1820s and 1830s, Lower Canada's colonization movement had begun looking to Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean as a source of fertile and unclaimed lands, hoping to prevent emigration of at least some of the province's booming French-speaking population. As a result, the first wave of colonialism in the region, which centered on exploitation of, of fur-bearing species uh, by the Innu for the sale to outside merchants, gave way to a second wave characterized above all by incoming settlers. French Canadians, primarily from the neighboring Charlevoix region, began colonizing uh, the shores of the Saguenay River in the 1830s before continuing on to the lands surrounding Lac Saint-Jean uh, in the 1850s. Beyond settlement, uh, this, this period was also characterized by a focus on forestry, largely directed by extra regional capital, coupled with the locally controlled subsistence agriculture. From the late 1830s then, colonialism in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean led to the arrival and continued presence of a stationary settler population and to the creation of local markets in which agricultural produce, as well as furs and manufactured goods changed hands. Um, Due to the historic and contemporaneous presence, uh, French presence in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, the HBC here uh, did something it didn't really do elsewhere, and it referred to the made beaver as a castor. Uh, although the, the records of the company are, are unclear on this, it would appear that at mid-century, the Innu and the HBC traded uh, at Metabetuan, so, which was the main post at this point, uh, based on a system of book uh, debits and credits um, from which circulating media of exchange were absent. Despite transactions that appear to be pure barter, the exchange of furs for provisions alongside the sale of furs towards the repayment of book debt suggests that the Innu and the HBC evaluated, evaluated all exchange regardless of its specific form in monetary terms. Um, though accounting practice, and here I'll uh, show you, uh, this is a picture that I just came across today of David E. Price uh, carrying, um, carrying the Prince of Wales across a, a river uh, on his back as one does uh, when the water rises. Um, he, um, so David E. Price uh, here is uh, the eldest son and partner of William Price. So whose, uh, whose company is dominating forestry in the region in the period. He's also uh, the MLA at this point for Shikutimi and Tadusak. Uh, and he is sort of appointed himself the Indian agent, although the Department of Indian Affairs has yet to do so, uh, and never appoints him actually to, to the role. Um, he asserts that the system of carrying on business allowed the HBC uh, to fleece the Innu through the conscious manipulation of the value of its in-house currency. Uh, and he should know, I could say as an aside, because um, uh, William Price and Company had its own in-house currency system, so he knew very well how, how to wring profit uh, out of uh, sort of a private monetary system. Uh, he, he writes in a report in 1857 that the company here trade by castors, which they change in value to suit their own purposes from sixpence to two shillings sixpence, so that no one but the clerk knows what he values them at. As for instance, one day a castor represents one quarter pound of powder and the next day one pound. The Indian sells his furs for so many castors and more he gets, the more value he fancies he has obtained for his furs. But as the value of the castor is changed to suit the company's purpose, the poor Indian is taken in without his being aware of it. Um, I would say that this is in incredibly unlikely in fact, uh, Indigenous peoples, the, the change of price, uh, Indigenous peoples would have noticed, uh, certainly. Uh, this is not um, something that they were not uh, aware of. Uh, but he, he basically, uh, so Price is asserting that because the HBC alone accepts this form of money, uh, it uh, encouraged kind of monopolistic exchange over free market uh, exchange. And it also prevented, in his words, uh, indigenous peoples from appreciating the real uh, money, what money really was. Uh, quote, they do not know the value of money, but in few instances. As we will see, this perspective would be echoed in James Bay where outsiders failed to see money since the made beaver did not correspond to their predefined definitions. Uh, that said, a number of scholars' research suggests that Price may have been strictly speaking right when he claimed the Innu did not know the value of money, but in few instances. Writing in the 1930s, anthropologist Julius Lips reported that the Innu placed little stock in money, using cash for not for indispensable food, but, quote, for only uh, luxuries such as pickles, mustards, sweets, etc. 
Legal scholar uh, Jean-Paul Lacasse uh, has suggested uh, why this was the case. Because money was a tool or a means to an end, Lacasse argues that the Innu did not think of saving for the future. Money, like other material objects, having, quote, no value in and of itself. Instead, they share or spend it, quote, because it exists to be used. In contrast to human and other than human persons, animals and plants in Lacasse's formulation, quote, money is not alive and so is not respected. So here we see this sort of, you know, this notion that money is something that, uh, you know, is not all that important uh, and so can be sort of used on a variety of, of objects that bring kind of immediate pleasure. Whatever the case, the availability of cash was largely the result of the arrival en masse of settlers, many of whom competed with the HBC by either trapping furs themselves or acting as middlemen. Unlike the situation in Rupert's land, the HBC did not possess a, mo a monopoly on exporting furs from Canada, which made the company's operations in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean vulnerable to both small and large competitors who could sell either to the merchant furriers of Quebec City uh, and Montreal or indeed to the HBC itself. This competition, whether carried on by, uh, by settler or indigenous traders, most frequently operated as a sideline to other economic activities and therefore necessitated virtually no additional expenditure on the part of fur buyers. Furthermore, since uh, the fur trade was not the primary industry in which such competitors were engaged, they did not seek profit in the same way as the HBC on the sale of goods as well as on the purchase of furs. Rather than maintaining a network of stores and all that that implied, uh, small traders paid for furs and cash, which the Innu were then free to spend wherever they saw fit. Such pressure irrevocably altered the HBC's monetary regime, something made even more striking by the timing of the changeover uh, to state-backed accounting currency in the company's posts in the region. And so again, just to remind you of what these look like. Uh, by 1849, if not before, Shikutimi uh, replaced beaver money in its books with provincial or Halifax currency for all of its accounts. Uh, so this is kind of the earliest on the Saguenay where you're starting to get uh, uh, settlers who are coming in. Uh, as I remind you, uh, the settlement then moved around the lake after that. By the late 1850s, uh, in accord with uh, the general movement toward the use of decimal currency in the Canadas, the HBC had uh, switched monetary no notation once again at the post, this time in favor of the dollar. Metabechuan, for its uh, part, began introducing provincial currency to its books in the mid-1840s, even as some accounts continued to be kept in Castor. Since individual sales and purchases were always recorded in the same units, the Innu themselves seemed to have decided which money of account was used. Through the 1850s, the number of Innu trading in provincial currency slowly grew until, by the beginning of the following decade, the HBC accounted for all of its uh, all of its business in the region in dollars. The following decade, uh, though, was when the HBC's monetary dam well and truly broke. In 1860, the company made its first payment in banknotes to an Innu uh, for furs, and over the course of the next 15 years, it regularly paid, uh, and it's, a, it's a pretty wide uh, range, but 5 to 25% of the, the total value of uh, First Nations hunts in cash. Though these numbers are impressive, in some ways it is even more impressive that the HBC resisted the cash trade as long as it did in light of the amounts paid by small fur buyers. Though we have virtually no direct evidence of small buyers activities, the indirect evidence speaks volumes. In 1858, for example, the Innu provided uh, the visiting Oblate missionary with 127 pounds uh, currency with which to renovate the small chapel at Metabechuan. This was anything but an insignificant amount, being over four times what an Innu trapper earned in cash and goods from the HBC in an average year at the time. Substantial religious donations would continue through the first half of the 1860s, with the Innu contributing more than, uh, than $1,200 to the renovation of their chapel at Metabechuan, so continuing to pay for this. As this was roughly equivalent to what uh, the Innu collectively earned in cash from the HBC over the period, uh, some of which was spent, you know, so some of this money was spent at the HBC Post, they clearly earned substantial amounts from other sources as well. Whatever the case, cash uh, had become a central piece of the company's operations in the region, a role that would expand 
uh, again from the end of the century as the HBC dramatically increased its cash buying operations and began uh, providing banknotes to the Innu on credit. So this is absolutely kind of mind boggling. Uh, if you read the HBC uh, correspondence that they actually were giving out cash as credit. So providing credit rather in good, not in goods, but in, in cash. Uh, this would have been unthinkable uh, only a few decades before and in, in many other places. Uh, they would have been unthinkable as well at the same time in far northern Ontario. And this is where we turn our attention now. Um, in 1900, uh, James Bay's monetary system closely resembled that of Saguenay Lac Saint Jean, uh, you know, uh, roughly a century before, in that the Moose Factory Cree expressed market value when dealing with Indigenous entities such as the with non-Indigenous entities, excuse me, such as the HBC or the Anglican Church in terms of beaver currency. They most often did so through HBC ledgers, approximating earlier practice in cash poor Southern Canada. Along with the tokens the company circulated, its books provided a means of payment for transactions between the Cree and others, like the church, uh, in which the HBC was not directly involved. In this instance, the HBC provided the same service that generations of settler merchants had done further south. That is, it used its ledgers to square credits and debits between Cree and clergymen for transactions in which the company was not directly involved. Uh, here's a, a picture of uh, what Moose Factory looked like at the time. Um, in 1859, uh, John Horden, the Anglican Bishop of Moosonee, printed a, a syllabic version of the Gospels uh, at Moose Factory. That's the document you see there on the left. Years later, he reported having charged almost certainly through the HBC's ledgers, quote, two shillings each, a little less than one beaver skin, using the money thus raised to purchase paper for the following year's print run. Sophia Noonham, whose brother succeeded Horden as Bishop from 1893 to 1903, observed, and this is, this is uh, underlined there, uh, observed Cree monetary donations to the Church of England at Moose Factory in terms that recall those made by the Innu to the Catholic Church in saguenay lac saint jean According to Newnham, one woman, quote, had just earned four beaver by extra hard work at the factory, and this she put, and of this she put a paper for half beaver into the plate. Though May Beaver coins and notes circulated in HBC controlled territory into the 20th century, post employees and hunter trappers most often use the currency in its abstract form, uh, accounting for both the vast majority of sales on credit and the marginal straight barter transactions in May Beaver. This explains the failure of many visitors to, to recognize trade in the region as monetary at all. While an Ontario magistrate echoing Price's remarks made 30 years earlier claimed in 1890 that the Cree had, quote, very little idea of the value of money or currency, 16 years later, a high ranking Indian Affairs official argued that trade in far northern Ontario, quote, had been heretofore limited to computation with sticks and skins. Uh, this is a particular uh, motif we see coming back uh, among the more literally in, uh, literary uh, inclined uh, commentators. So DC Scott, for example, uh, you know, waxes poetic about the, the kind of the, the savagery from which indigenous peoples are emerging and talks a lot about uh, sticks and, and, and skins. The region's Euro-Canadian residents disagreed, however, recognizing sophisticated indigenous money use. In 1891, the HBC's inspector for James Bay argued that even if the Cree had no access to state-backed cash, quote, the money they earn can be, can earned by work, excuse me, at Moose during the summer months, uh, explained their refusal to travel to more southerly posts, such as Abbey TB, uh, where uh, the Canadian dollar circulated widely. Just as in saguenay lac saint jean the company attempted to prevent the circulation of non-beaver currency in James Bay, though it was never entirely successful. The Cree managed to gain access to a certain amount of cash originating from two sources. Um, Small independent traders active on the edge of the region, generally along the railway and HBC posts in these same peripheral areas uh, that uh, given the much larger settler population were unable to control uh, the money supply. And in fact, um, they, the, um, the company ended up losing a number of uh, its best sort of trappers to places like uh, Abitibi, uh, where uh, even though they were trying to raise prices for furs uh, 
at Moose Factory to keep them uh, local. Uh, despite these efforts, then uh, a handful of their best hunters uh, regularly traveled to uh, Abitibi um, that had been paying cash since at least the late uh, 1880s. Despite this shift, uh, it's HBC's upper management had no intention of altering its means uh, of payment farther north. The arrival of a major new competitor, however, forced its hand. Uh, this was Révillon Frère, uh, a centuries old fur furrier who was looking to lower its cost, who uh, began purchasing pelts directly from indigenous peoples across the Canadian subarctic at the turn of the 20th century. The French company first established itself in Western James Bay in the summer of 1902, adjacent to the HBC post at, post at the mouth, excuse me, at the mouth of the Moose River. Rather than traveling by, seas, by sea with supplies and materials to construct a post, its employees came overland to Western James Bay. They built a temporary trading post while awaiting the delivery of building materials, supplies, and staff scheduled to arrive the following summer. However, that, that in 1903, the company's supply ship ran aground near Fort George, causing the loss of all provisions aboard. From July 1902 until the summer of 1904, then the French company relied solely on canoes to convey people and goods to the region. And, and these weren't numerous, they were, they were few and far between. As a result, uh, it did not even have adequate supplies to support its own employees, much less trade with the Cree. While the HBC informed the French company that it would not be responsible if any employees were to die of starvation and instructed post managers to refuse cash payments from Revion employees, local HBC staff apparently ignored these statements as they significantly increased cash sales uh, at Moose Factory and its sales shop. So Moose Factory was sort of split up into two different places. There was a, a sales shop which sold goods to non-Indigenous uh, visitors or people on the bay, and then the rest of the the the, the sales went through uh, the the traditional part of the post. So the sales shop really is the only place where money was being was being uh, spent, and you see a massive increase in this period uh, when Revion doesn't have supplies. Though its cash business declined sharply uh, after uh, the supply ship comes in in 1904. For Revion, the HBC had abandoned beaver currency at Moose Factory by this point. Um, so they had always only used with Cree uh, beaver, uh, beaver currency prior to the arrival of Revion. But basically, Revion had managed to convert the whole fur trade to uh, the dollar, though this became again a purely abstract system uh, from 1904. Um, and Revion Frère's use of dollars and cents challenged the HBC's dominance of the fur trade, the centrality of its currency to setting uh, the terms of exchange and the expression of value and its ability to, to define James Bay in symbolic terms as lying outside the bounds of the nation state to the south. So here we see uh, the Cree like the Innu who are very much interested in changing the terms of trade, even if it's only uh, abs in abstract terms. Though beaver currency gave way in the face of Revion Frère's use of the dollar, um, the HBC staff discounted in letters to upper management the newcomers' chances of capturing any significant part of the fur market owing to their lack of merchandise. But the HBC's own archives make it clear uh, that they were um, they were uh, doing a, a good business, uh, Revion was. They were uh, buying a lot of uh, furs with, uh, with money. Uh, and many Cree profited handsomely. Indeed, according to the Anglican missionary based at Fort Albany from 1899, the Cree took advantage of Revion Frère's uh, supply difficulties in order to charge them, quote, Parisian prices for fish and game. Despite HBC claims to the contrary, the Cree viewed accepting cash in exchange for furs, meat, and other country provisions as advantageous. Uh, and indeed, the HBC's claims were entirely disingenuous uh, because they launched a cash fur buying program at the same time to try to combat uh, Revion. Uh, and they paid uh, several hundred dollars uh, each in both 1903 and 1904 to uh, create trappers to, uh, to, to, to secure their furs. Um, but the fur trade um, on its own uh, failed to provide a, a durable means of um, 
of transforming uh, this sort of relationship between the fur companies and uh, and indigenous peoples. Uh, this had to wait for this, the coming of the state. So in 1905, uh, several Cree and Ojibwe communities in far northern Ontario signed Treaty 9 with the federal and provincial governments. Together, Ontario and Canada assembled a team of negotiators who boarded a train from Ottawa in late June 1905, embarking on a trip that would last two and a half months and see them sign Treaty 9 at seven locations in the province's far north, providing direct monetary payments. Okay, so the, the, um, the arrival of... Um, of the state uh, through uh, Treaty 9 uh, changes things uh, significantly. Um, they arrive at Moose Factory. So I'm focused uh, primarily here on Moose Factory, but the, a similar story can be told uh, about uh, all of these, these nations that sign uh, the treaty in 1905 and then in 1906. Um, they arrive in Moose Factory on August 8th. The next day, uh, the, the treaty commissioners, along with the Anglican Bishop and the local HBC manager, met Cree representatives to discuss and sign the treaty. On August 10th, the commissioners both began and rapidly completed the payment of a one-time $8 gratuity to be followed every year thereafter by a $4 annuity to each Indian member of the community. Uh, and this is this uh, we could talk about this later if you're interested, but there's a kind of a, a problematic definition of what's an Indian, uh, according to the law here. Regardless of the money, uh, Revient Frères and others uh, exchanged for furs, these payments provided the first substantial and regular influx of Canadian cash into Western James Bay. They immediately and definitively pushed the HBC to abandon its policy of refusing uh, both to accept and to supply Canadian currency. Though impossible to trace in detail, um, it seems certain that the 337 uh, Moose Factory Cree um, used the uh, nearly $2,700 they received from the commissioners in 1905 in a variety of ways. If they had spent all of this money at the HBC post, cash sales uh, in 1905-06 would have uh, arisen by approximately this amount. They did not, only growing by roughly $1,000, so $1,700 short. Uh, in other words, this figure suggests that the Cree spent only 40% or so of uh, the total gratuity payment at the HBC post. Uh, it's reasonable to assume that they spent uh, roughly the same amount uh, at the Rivière Frère post, which was fully stocked by that point. Uh, they certainly donated a substantial portion of the remaining funds, uh, but uh, they almost certainly uh, retained some, saved some for further use as well. If we assume that in the five years following treaty, uh, treaty non-Indigenous customers uh, continued to spend at pre-1905 levels, the Cree would have used anywhere from 60 to 180% of their annuities at the post, suggesting that they certainly saved some or they were getting a, a large amount of money um, from other uh, other sources, so this is a year uh, yearly. It sort of fluctuates uh, where they're where they're spending their money. Um, okay, the importance of cash in James Bay was never pur purely economic, though. Treaty commissioners supplied money in 1905 alongside other material goods, suits of clothes for the chiefs, the Union Jack to be displayed when hosting important outsiders, that together marked far northern Ontario as belonging to Canada. Money circulated daily, spreading the iconi uh, iconographic, scriptural, and textual symbolism developed by banks in the state over the preceding century, and providing perhaps the most banal means through which Canada laid claim to space. So D.C. Scott, one of the 1905 treaty commissioners and the, uh, the notorious uh, future head of the Department of Indian Affairs, informed Scribner's magazine that the treaty party transported by canoe, quote, the, tre the treasure chest, which was heavy with $30,000 in small notes. The commissioners used this impressive amount of, quote, new crisp notes to pay gratuities in 1905, which came in the form of one and two dollar notes issued by the Dominion in 1897 and 1898, pictured here, uh, both of which illustrated Canada's commitment to natural resource development. The $1 note featured a logging scene flanked by the governor general and his wife on the front and an imposing architecture of parliament on the back. While the $2 note depicted fishermen catching cod next to a portrait of the Prince of Wales on one side uh, and a scene of farmers harvesting wheat on the other. 
Though the indigenous peoples living north of the height of land did not cultivate wheat, many of them had experience cutting hay for the Hudson's Bay Company, and they surely would have understood the meaning of fishing and logging too. Continuing the narrative found on the cash used for annuities in the 1870s, so the initial numbered treaties following the, the sale of Rupert's land, then treaty money told a story in which the state oversaw the exploitation of natural resources by non-Indigenous workers. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, however, uh, this story did not even need to mention First Nations, uh, managing to do away with even the utterly passive Indigenous character presented in the 1870s. Uh, and so this is a broader story of money. If we look through Canadian money, uh, you know, Indigenous peoples figure prominently early on and then disappear as we, uh, as we move into the 20th century. And the later we get into the 20th century, people, in fact, by the mid 20th century disappear altogether. It just becomes all, all nature all the time, I guess. Um, Though vi treaty visibly undercut the power and authority of fur trade companies, uh, it in no way ended them. Uh, over the period that follows, um, the state runs its programs through the HBC and in fact hides them or, or in, um, it requests that the HBC continue uh, to behave as if this was their, their funds funding relief rather than state funds. Um, and so they, they you know, kept this under wraps. Uh, and the, the HBC remains kind of the effective power on the ground. Um, and uh, the department did not station its first agent in the region until August 1929. Over the intervening 24 years, an Indian Affairs employee was only present in Western James Bay uh, once a year at treaty time. Uh, at Moose Factory, this always occurred at the HBC post, the same location at which the Royal Canadian Mounted Police established uh, a year-round presence in 1926. In the 20 years that followed treaty, and indeed through mid-century, uh, as I said already, uh, the state ran its, uh, its programs through, um, through the, the HBC and Revillon Frères. And both companies were entirely happy to have uh, their programs funded for them by the state as they could quote, uh, use uh, these as a lever to obtain the goodwill of the Indians. Um, and so this, this allowed the, the, the HBC and the state uh, to disguise the origin of in-kind payments, making them appear to be relief as traditionally employed in the fur trade. Uh, and this has to do with uh, a broader discussion that I can't go into in this talk, but uh, this sort of conviction on the part of many bureaucrats uh, that, um, that Indigenous peoples were inherently improvident. Um, so at first, uh, the HBC adopting a, a practice used in the relatively remote corners of Treaty 3 territory accepted only limited cash payments uh, in lands under Treaty 9. Uh, however, the amount of currency it received grew steadily following 1905. So if the, the books that the HBC archives have uh, continue into the 1920s and we see a, a massive increase uh, or a steady increase, I guess, uh, year in, year out in the amount of cash being used in uh, trades, uh, both as uh, both to purchase furs and uh, in uh, exchange for, for goods. Um, the growth of the HBC of in HBC cash sales is uh, all the more remarkable because each Cree received twice as much in treaty payments in 1905 as in every subsequent year. Uh, this this gets halved in annuities uh, compared to gratuities. Uh, before uh, bringing the end to um, excuse me, um, I'll skip that. Together, these numbers suggest, so all of this, this change, that uh, an economy in which the Cree spent far more cash at Moose Factory than they received at the HBC post, whether in exchange for furs or in the form of annuities. In the decades following 1905 then, the Cree imported cash into Western James Bay that the HBC later exported. This pattern indicates an important difference between Western James Bay and Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean. If settlers flocked to the latter region, bringing their Southern cash with them, they did not do so in the former. While the HBC found its monetary system replaced by that of the state in James Bay, its economic role remained more or less intact. If Revillon Frère challenged the HBC's dominance, it did not remake James Bay's economy, infrastructure, or population. This change would come, but not until public servants and a wider variety of external economic actors entered the region in the, in the, 1920, the late 1920s and early 1930s, fundamentally altering the Cree's economy and their relationship to both the state 
and the HBC. Beyond the business of the fur trade, one final point remains to be made with respect to the changing monetary system. In replacing fur trade money, the arrival of Canadian currency also contributed to the process through which the region came to be identified with southern polities rather than with overseas uh, commercial and political empire. To the Innu and Cree who consciously decided to embrace new monetary forms, though, this was not a story of impending doom at the hands of the state, but rather one of lessening the HBC's power over their day-to-day -day lives while reaching for new economic opportunities. However, as I explore in the book, the state's arrival undermined both the Crees and the Innu's ability to realize the benefits these opportunities promised. Indeed, at exactly the same time as Southern currency replaced the castor, the state rejected calls to recognize Innu rights to lands and resources through treaty and the annuities that would have accompanied it, offering institutionalized in-kind relief instead. In Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, as elsewhere, officials saw only, uh, quote, improvident Indians. The Innu, though, failed to fit the image. They were not alone. The Western James Bay Cree also sought improved economic conditions for themselves in ways that entirely failed to correspond to official expectations. Though concluding a treaty, the state was not much of an improvement over the HBC in far northern Ontario either. After decades of neglect, during which time it let the HBC and the Révillon Frères assume its responsibilities with respect to the Cree, in the 1940s, the state inserted itself directly into the fur trade in Western James Bay when it established the Kezagami Beaver Sanctuary. Though aimed at economic revitalization through the reintroduction to the territory of large numbers of beavers uh, that had been trapped out by unemployed Southerners during the Depression, the Indian Affairs branch ultimately took on the role of fur marketer, significantly driving down the price uh, uh, the Cree could earn per skin and working as resolutely as the HBC had ever done to control Indigenous access to cash. Though federal officials stepped away from management of the fur trade in the 1950s, the sector was rapidly losing vitality and both the Cree and the Innu were increasingly employed elsewhere. Uh, this is, uh, as an aside, the sort of federal uh, initiatives that are often tied to the fur trade, the fur trade companies and pr uh, the provinces in the, the mid 20th century uh, have the effect often of uh, reinvigorating beaver populations, but also of closing uh, trapping for a number of years, which encourage people to leave the sector. From the 19th through the middle of the 20th century then, and to conclude, money in the fur trade constituted an important and ongoing concern for First Nations, companies, individual traders, and the state alike. Paying attention to it leads us to a deeper and richer understanding of a particularly important and emblematic sector of Canada's historical economy. Doing so also helps reveal the critical role earlier forms of territorial management and business played in the development of the settler colonial state and its claims to sovereignty in the subarctic. Of course, today I have only been able to hint at this more capacious, I guess, take on Canadian history. I do some of this work in my book, which I invite you all to read, uh, but much remains to be done. Uh, I am excited at, at the prospect of others taking up this work, whether to study money more thoroughly in, in other contexts uh, or to push our analyses of the fur trade in new and exciting directions. And I can't, to see, I can't wait to see what comes next. Thank you. Well, thank you. A round of applause for Professor Gettler. Uh, a great talk and he was able to overcome a few technical difficulties, which we all understand in the age of COVID, but uh, really interesting uh, stuff there, great images, uh, a, a really excellent uh, presentation. So thank you. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions, maybe two or three, um, uh, which we're happy to take. Uh, and I'm going to just suggest that people, it's a small enough group for, at present, so people just want to turn on their camera, put their hand up, and if they would like to ask a question of Professor Gettler, uh, that would be great. Uh, so please uh, do take advantage of the few minutes that we have to ask uh, whatever questions that you may have. Uh, I see one hand up from uh, Joe Martin. Are there others uh, in the queue? Uh, okay, and Andrew Ross. So why don't we start with uh, uh, you two? So please go ahead, Joe, and make sure to unmute your uh, microphone. Hi, I am. Uh, this is not specifically around monetary. I think the world was you consider in this area. From I understand, Joe. Right. 
Yeah, I'm having trouble understanding as well, Joe. Uh, something seems to be wrong with your sound. Yeah, your your sound is way off. You sound kind of uh, robotic, like um, maybe a Cylon from um, Battlestar Galactica a little bit. Can I ask you to type your question quickly into the chat? Um, and in the meantime, yeah, because we can't understand you at all. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, your, your mic seems to have gone. Uh, Andrew, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, Joe, if you if you you have the option, if you want to, okay, he's going to pass. Andrew, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks, Brian. That's a fascinating talk. I will uh, buy your book online. Uh, <clears throat> often at our AGMs, we're able to buy directly from the author, so you're unfortunately missing out on that opportunity. So hopefully, you'll see the see the royalties coming through Amazon at some point. Um, I just wanted to ask you a, a self-serving question about archives. I mean, you you had some really interesting photos and in, in ephemera there, and you nicely cited what I was happy to see, but it strikes me that you probably had a pretty challenging time looking for evidence in the archives. Like there is no money money phone, uh, you know, in the archives of Ontario. And I'm just wondering how you how you overcame that challenge of, of finding this and gathering together this, this wide variety of evidence to, to, to build your story. Yeah, I mean, it, a lot of it was sort of a needle in a haystack kind of work. Um, and it, it took me a while to figure out exactly how to do uh, the, the work. Uh, initially, I had a very sort of naive take on this, right? Um, and I thought, oh, I'll just look at, you know, wherever there's dollar notation or pound notation or whatever, and I'll, I'll just pull that stuff in and and uh, that'll be easy. But of course, that's absurd, right? That that doesn't actually work. Uh, and it required me to think a bit more uh, deeply about what, uh, what I was actually uh, after here. Um, and one of the things that I noticed, I mean, I think I had the good fortune of working with a number of people, um, other grad students who we sort of pooled our efforts in, in certain ways. Uh, so we were kind of working in similar, uh, I guess you could do a Venn diagram of things we were working on uh, at the same time. And there were there were areas of overlap. And so in those areas of overlap, we tried to to grab everything we could. So this was in, you know, the era pre mass digitization of things. Uh, and so, you know, I had colleagues uh, scanning microfilm from from the Hudson's Bay Company archives, for example, for me. And looking through those, uh, you know, at first I was really, um, I thought, okay, so I could do, uh, I could do just sort of tables and, and math, uh, but that didn't seem to tell the story I actually, I actually wanted to tell. And especially once I got into the account books uh, in the Sagne, um, the thing that really struck me was one of the things that I talked about is this this moment where you have, uh, you know, different accounting currencies in the same document, and I couldn't understand this. I thought, like, at first, I thought maybe some of these people are indigenous and non-indigenous, but it's not actually the case. So if you go over a long time um, frame, you end up seeing that this changes over time. So you know, and it it all goes in one direction, uh, and so then I started looking. Um, at account books and those sorts of things, but in a much, in a, in a not, um, I'd say a, a broad sort of way, because of course that sort of um, uh, numerical or, you know, quantitative history is extremely valuable, but also extremely daunting and, and difficult to do. Uh, and then other things, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff that I didn't talk about today has to do with like uh, the Department of Indian Affairs and a number of, of the kind of big debates that I came across, I found in um, published documents. And so then I could go into the archive to, to, to sort of zero in on particular dates. Uh, and also I made the decision very early on to focus on a handful of communities, which, which shapes the story. I'm sure it would be different if I had worked on different First Nations, uh, but it allowed me to really uh, try to get everything I possibly could and then read through for these fleeting, uh, these fleeting traces. And ultimately uh, that ended up providing plenty of material, uh, I think for, for a, good, a good analysis and a convincing argument. Thanks a lot. I noticed there's a question in the, some in the chat there as well, Dimitri. Yeah, there's a couple questions. Um, uh, Brian, I'm not sure if you have access to the chat. If you I want do. to flip over there, uh, Professor Sweeney has asked a question there and has William Hewitt. Uh, the first one is a little bit more of a factual question. The second one, 
uh, if you, you can tackle either one of those. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll start with I'll start with uh, William Hewitt's question. When did Canada shift from the pound sterling to dollars, as you uh, referenced referred to uh, dollars uh, circa early 1800s? Well, actually, uh, Canada never really used the pound sterling. Uh, it used uh, it used currency, so which was a pound system. Uh, but it was not rated at the same rating as the as the ster as sterling. So, um, if you want to get way down into the weeds, uh, initially, right after the conquest, there are a number of different ratings. There's the 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 Halifax rating, York rating, New York rating, and they end up converging on what's the Halifax rating. So that's eventually by the early 19th century, people are just talking about uh, provincial currency. Uh, so that's a pound-based system. And then the shift to the dollar um, is organic and it takes a long time, but you know, the banks, the Bank of Montreal, its first, its first notes um, in 1817 have dollars on them already because of the wide spread use of uh, Spanish silver, uh, though they're accounting for these as well in a pound system. And it's in uh, the 1850s, I think, uh, I, I'd have to look up the date, the exact date when uh, basically there's there's a move, uh, the first move happens around mid-century where they say um, all official accounts uh, need to be in, um, in pounds and dollars. And then shortly thereafter, it switches to they may be in pounds, but they have to be in dollars. Uh, and so then the pound basically just just falls off the map. Um, oh, so uh, a question and more of an answer. My apologies. OK. Um, dollars are used for the late 18th century. But yep. Professor Sweeney does have a question. Go ahead. Yes, I do. Um, well, thank you very much for an interesting talk. And like everyone else, probably I have yet to have purchased your book, but I look forward to reading it soon. Um, you mentioned that in exchanges with non-Indigenous people, particularly clergy, um, uh, credit was used by the, 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 the HPC offered its services as, as a kind of um, exchange uh, place for transactions between other people in the community. Is there any evidence uh, for them doing that among Indigenous people in an attempt to capture the inf and monetize the informal economy of Indigenous society? That's a great question. I, I haven't seen anything uh, that, uh, that makes that clear. I mean, there is a certain amount, once you get into Later into the 20th century, a number of indigenous peoples are um, acting as sort of subcontractors for the fur trade companies. Mm -hmm. And so there you have, uh, you know, this um, market relationship of what might have been an informal uh, economic relationship at, at an earlier point. Uh, but I haven't seen in the books of the company in the period I was talking about, so the late 19th century in, in James Bay, for example, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen that at all um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, okay. Thank sorry. you. <laughs> yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there other questions from the audience? I'll take a raised hand, or you can just uh, start speaking if you wish. Uh, if I could, I'll take the uh, moderator's uh, right and ask a question myself. Uh, I'm just interested uh, in getting some clarification on the timeline when you talk about the state's entry into the dynamic. Uh, because, you know, my reading, uh, remembering of uh, this stuff is that, uh, you know, the HBC sold, sells Rupert's Land in 1870. Uh, and before uh, Treaty 9, uh, you know, there's that period where uh, it's a territory, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so it's officially part of Ontario uh, before, uh, well before the treaty comes in. Um, and again, uh, this is not, I think, the 1870s, even uh, 1880s. Um, and in fact, by um, 
they begin, there's a, there's a passage that I took out of the talk because it's, it's in the book uh, that has to do with taxation. And um, from the 1880s, I believe, uh, Canada is levying taxes on goods landed at Moose Factory. And so you have reports where they're estimating, I think these sort of wildly, um, wildly over the top sort of estimates. It seems like, you know, they're using the estimates as a way of critiquing the fact that in, in, a, in a strange reversal of the kind of discourse you'll hear today about indigenous peoples and taxation, they say that like basically they're taxing them through the teeth and they're giving them no services in return. Uh, and, but, tax is being is being levied on on goods um and so the state is sort of there but there it's kind of invisible on the ground right so prices on goods um and i haven't done a sort of a very clear analysis of this uh, somebody would have to do this but i i, I imagine prices increase uh over this period uh, as a result of of these taxes but nobody's telling anyone where it's coming from, right? So like the, the HBC knows where this is coming, you know, where these this additional price is coming from. But um, as far as I can tell, there's no discussion happening on the ground uh, that this is, you know, like the, the trader is saying to the Cree, uh, look, this costs more because, uh, because of taxation. Okay. Uh, you know, if I could, I'm just gonna ask a quick follow-up question that builds on the state. Uh, you know, we know that the, this is a federal uh, thing primarily because of Indians uh, and because of money. Uh, but we also know that provincial governments uh, sneak their way in here oftentimes and it's never any clash of federalism. Yeah. And I always ask a federalism question, but uh, you know, does the, does the provincial government, uh, you know, get in some way, shape or form? Are they involved? Is there any question of federalism or is it just completely a federal issue that's, that's from the get-go to the end? Well, the, the treaty is provincial too. I mean, they're involved. And in fact, the treaty, like that's where you see, um, if you read the treaty nine documents, that's where you see uh, the first like clear legal justification I've seen of why Quebec is not involved. Uh, and it's not coming from Quebec. It's coming from the federal government who says, well, Quebec doesn't sign treaties. Um, and, and so because treaty nine is right up against the, the Quebec border, right? Uh, and the Cree don't pay attention to that border, uh, obviously. Uh, they don't even, many of them probably don't even know it's there, right? Uh, but um, the, um, the assumption, you know, so the province is involved, but really marginally uh, until later. Uh, the province really becomes involved in what I'm looking at anyways, with, um, with attempts to um, regulate hunting and trapping basically. So uh, the province is involved with the fur, uh, fur preserves that get started up in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, but, um, and mostly with enforcement actually. So the federal government tends to run the sort of day-to-day -day pieces of the preserve uh, and uh, the province runs, um, runs enforcement on poaching and, and, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, if they need to, if they need to, um, if they need to bring anyone to court or whatever, uh, that's the province that handles that. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's it's an interesting. I just made, made me think about uh, you know federalism and can't get away from it. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, I, I just take a moment to ask if there's anyone else with a question for Professor Gettler. Can I just try again? Oh yeah. Okay, Joey, it's working. Yep. Brian, uh, and, and and this is not directly, but in the relationship between the First Nations and the Hudson Bay Company, and looking at it from the Hudson Bay Company perspective, are the First Nations customers or suppliers? Uh, I think it, it, it depends on who you're asking, but I guess if we're looking at it structurally, to my mind, uh, the First Nations are everything. Uh, and this has to do with the, the, you know, the strangeness, the kind of, uh, of the HBC's accounting mechanisms, you know, they, they, uh, the HBC sets up its accounting mechanism and, and continues to use this for a very long time, where um, they say, if all of the units in 
uh, in the company, and so that goes from post to district to department to company are profitable, then the company must be profitable. Uh, and so the post managers are constantly being told, they're, they're being told to watch out for debt, but they're also being told to make sure that they make as much profit as possible. And so this plays out on both sides. Uh, this plays out on the purchase of furs, uh, you know, and there, but the real encouragement I see anyways in the archives uh, are coming from um, this sort of paranoia about debt. Uh, and that's, and, and so that is on the sale of goods and the inability to re recoup uh, that. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, the company, the post managers change the prices. Uh, so often, if you do the, the, the calculation from when goods are purchased on credit in the fall and furs are sold back in the, in the spring, uh, what you'll see is that uh, the price of, uh, of goods effectively have gone up. Uh, and so there is kind of interest built into this uh, from the company, but the company very rarely recognizes that. Uh, and so they just harp on about about debt, but you know this it's this kind of never ending um, discourse, and yet the company remains profitable. Uh, and so it's sort of a kind of a kind of an open secret. Like there's disciplining of 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 employees going on there. I feel like, but I to answer your question, I think it's I think it's both. I think wow, I yeah. it's a very different model. Yep, very interesting. Fascinating. Um, well, if there are no other questions, uh, I think at this juncture, we're gonna say thank you to Professor Gettler for uh, a, a great talk and thank you audience for uh, great questions as well, myself excluded. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was great. A really interesting talk. We very much appreciate it, Brian. Uh, it was really a, a great way to end our annual general meeting. And, and just before we do sign off, a couple of quick uh, notes that I have to pass along uh, to everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind uh, members of our next CBHA ACHA talk on Friday, February 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Andrea Benoit, whose talk is entitled Corporate Social Responsibility and the Creative Practices of Mac Cosmetics. So we're going from the HBC and Maid Beaver and money in uh, you know 19th century all the way to Mac in the 20th and 21st, which is great. If you wish to register for this event, uh, please visit the CBHA website and you can find registration there. Uh, this now concludes the fifth annual general meeting of the CBHA ACHA. Uh, hope we'll have some more in the future, many more in the future. Uh, all of today's proceedings have been digitally recorded and will be posted in archives shortly on the website of the organization and also our YouTube channel, which you should also check out. Uh, thank you uh, all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next year. So thank you, everyone, and I will sign off. Uh, take care, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, best to everyone for 2021.